Hello my darlings and welcome back to Duchess of Success. Please remember to like, comment, share with your Megan loving besties and subscribe. It helps the channel to grow and more people to find it. So today's video is going to be a little bit different, a bit of history mixed with commentary on how royal women are treated when they are pregnant with a child and give birth. And it was actually the recent birth of baby Lily that had me thinking about this because this pregnancy was a lot more peaceful for Meghan than her pregnancy with Archie but it was also just so different from any other pregnancy of a woman married into or born into the royal family. For one, it's the first time a child to an heir of the British throne was born abroad and away from the eyes of the institution. Now anytime a royal baby is announced there is as there would be a lot of excitement which is fine, but there's something particularly objectifying, I think, about the way royal women are treated when they are pregnant that has always bothered me. And this isn't something that is unique to the British royal family, it's been the way of things for as long as kings and queens have existed. As a royal woman, particularly if you are married to the heir or the spare, your body is essentially a vessel to continue on the royal bloodline. So if you are unable to bear children and produce more heirs, you are essentially useless to the institution. I don't think I need to give you a history lesson on what's happened to Henry VIII's wives and how they were treated when they failed to produce a male heir and it has always been the preference that you do produce a male heir. But essentially you are as a royal woman reduced to your womb. I've always wondered what would have happened to Diana or Kate if they couldn't produce children. Do they check royal women's fertility before they marry into the family and if they couldn't produce children would adoption or surrogacy be an option? Given the pure blood mentality of royals, probably not. But it's an interesting thing to ponder, seen as we're not in the days of Henry VIII and you can't behead them. Now, Meghan worked all throughout her pregnancies doing royal engagements and had to put up with the intense bullying of the press who actually came down worse on her when she was pregnant and unlike in the past where the Queen told the press to back off, for example when Diana and Fergie were pregnant, Meghan did not get that protection. When you consider that she had a miscarriage, Archie really is a miracle baby because that baby was being attacked while in the womb. And I know that Meghan is a hard worker, but there was something about her doing all of those engagements while she was pregnant that really bothered me because I don't recall that Kate was ever pushed that hard during any of her pregnancies. In fact, to the contrary, for almost every pregnancy of Kate's, we were told that she was very poorly with severe morning sickness, which I'm not dismissing. But I can't help but feel that if it was Meghan, there would not have been the same level of sympathy extended to her as it was afforded to Kate. Which is why I feel there is something so powerful about the fact that Meghan, a woman of colour who was within the institution and escaped its clutches, got to have full control over her birthing process with her daughter. The symbolism of that cannot be understated. I'll never forget the headlines attacking Meghan for supposedly, and I say supposedly because it could have just been fake headlines with clicks, but supposedly saying no to using the Queen's doctors. Most royal women have their own midwives that they bring in when they are pregnant and I'm sure it was just a polite decline to use their assistance and much to do about nothing. But here are the doctors in question. Um, who's gonna say it? Now, I don't want to pass judgement on these individuals because I know nothing about them personally and they could well be very nice people, but given what a snake pit the firm is and the way we know that Meghan was treated, would you honestly want these men in grey suits around you in a vulnerable state? Anytime I have ever been in a doctor's office, I am asked if I would prefer to see a female doctor for more intimate matters and if a man is going to examine me, I am asked if I would like to have a female assistant present. As a woman, you have that right. So attacking Meghan because she did not want these men too close to her pregnant body is just ridiculous and there is a certain possessiveness about that that I just find disgusting. The attacks that came at Meghan by some quarters of the British public and press were shameful and it just stank of ownership 
It's like they were personally offended by this black biracial woman's choice not to have the men in grey suits anywhere near her during her pregnancy. And when I think of the current discussions that we've been having lately around black women and how we suffer disproportionately from complications during childbirth, it was just very, very tone deaf to attack Meghan in the way that they did. Now I'll get a little bit more into Archie's birth a bit later, but I did some digging into the experiences of royal women and birth in the past and I came across some historical tidbits I thought you might find interesting because they tie in quite closely with this conversation. There was a time when it was very common for numerous watchers, including members of the public, to actually be present when a royal woman gave birth. And perhaps no royal birth was more hotly anticipated than Queen Mary Antoinette of France's first baby in 1778. Although her mother, Empress Maria Theresa, had done away with public births in Austria, Marie Antoinette was unable to change the entrenched ways of Versailles. Antonia Fraser, the author of Marie Antoinette The Journey, wrote in great detail about the birth of Marie's daughter and described the scenes, saying, Early in the morning on December 19th, the Queen rang a bell, signalling that her labour had begun. Versailles quickly descended into chaos as avid sightseers hurried into the direction of the Queen's apartments. The crowds were mainly confined to outer rooms such as the gallery, but in the general pandemonium, several got through to the inner rooms. I mean, just imagine this. She continues. In all of the excitement, the Queen herself was practically an afterthought. After 12 hours, Marie Antoinette delivered a small girl. Although the child was not the desired boy, the Queen's apartments became so rowdy after the birth that Marie Antoinette had a seizure and fainted. The press of people, the heat and the lack of fresh air in the room whose windows had been sealed up for months against the winter cold, was too much for her and after a 12 hour labour, it took minutes before anyone even noticed the Queen was unconscious. Eventually, boards were ripped off the sealed windows, bringing a gust of fresh air into the room which revived the day's Queen. For the next 18 days, Marie Antoinette was kept in bed. Since her baby was a female, Antoinette was able to spend more time with her. A son would have belonged to the state. So through that, you can see how the thirst for royal births and the excitement it drums up in the public hasn't changed. But bringing it back to the modern age, what Marie Antoinette said to her daughter reminds me so much of something Diana said about Harry and William. She said that they, the firm, will look after the heir and I, the spare. So she knew because William was future king, she had little say over how she raised her own son and that ultimately he was a property of the firm. Her part was only to produce him, not raise him in a way that she saw fit. And well, just look at the differences between the two brothers. Now when we think of royal women and babies in the modern era, the first image that probably comes to your mind is when we see the mother and baby on the footsteps of a hospital. And I did wonder where this trend started and who was the first British royal woman to do this because traditionally royal babies had been born at home, all of Betty's kids were born in Buckingham Palace with the exception of Anne who was born in Clarence House as war bombings had damaged Buckingham Palace. It's also interesting to note that up until Charles's birth, royal births were always witnessed by a senior politician to ensure that the baby wasn't snatched and legitimate but the Queen's father said no more and that protocol was dashed. So where did the baby on the steps trend while being surrounded by the press rats clicking away start? Well that would be with Catherine, Duchess of Kent, who was the first British royal to deliver her baby in a hospital. Catherine was delivered of her second son Lord Nicholas Windsor at King's College Hospital on July 25th 1970. Following that would be Danish-born Bridget, Duchess of Gloucestershire, who was the first royal to give birth at St. Mary's Hospital. This is where the famous Lindo Wing is. And seven years later, on November 15th, 1977, Princess Anne, who was then fourth in line to the throne, delivered her son Peter Phillips at St. Mary's also, and four years later, Anne carried her daughter Zara Phillips down the steps of the Lindo Wing at St. Mary's. FYI, prices at the Lindo Wing start from about 7,500 a day and this is what you get for it. Now, Fergie also participated in the circus on the steps when she had her kids, but perhaps the person who solidified this as tradition was Princess Diana. But Diana did not speak highly of the experience at all. Speaking about posing for pictures after William's birth, 
Diana said, when I left the hospital, I could barely put one foot in front of the other. My stitches were killing me. It was such a strain to stand there and smile, even for just a few minutes. She added, as soon as the car disappeared around the corner, out of sight of the photographers, I burst into tears. So despite her bad experience, Diana felt compelled to repeat the performance two years later when Prince Harry was born and given the bloodlust for anything Diana related at the time, I'm pretty sure she did not have a choice in the matter. But despite the fact that Diana was vocal about not liking the experience, it is a tradition that has continued for royal women. Kate did it for all of her children, now in her case, she seemed to enjoy the experience and probably had her photo call outfits picked out from the time she was a little girl. We know how hard she worked to become a royal in the first place, but that doesn't make it right and I don't think it's a good message to be sending to see prominent women with a full face of makeup and perfectly blow dried hair looking so flawless after just pushing a human baby out of you and to be presented as an object to be consumed by the press and public. It just feels like a sterilisation of women's postnatal bodies, the rawness of childbirth and that rawness being primped and powdered for the public eyes, it's just never sat well with me. These people have beauty teams the average woman doesn't and it can, I think, in some women start a comparison game that they'll never win. I remember back in the 90s and 2000s there was an obsession of how quickly celebrity women would snap back after pregnancy as if it's a duty of women to look amazing after you've pushed a baby out of you. It's not. Now let's examine when Meghan had Archie. Meghan did not do the circus on the steps. At the time of Archie's birth, the palace released a statement saying, the Duke and Duchess look forward to sharing the exciting news with everyone once they have had an opportunity to celebrate privately as a new family. But when Meghan did an interview with Oprah, she told Oprah that because the royal family did not want to give Archie the title of Prince, the photo call was not a tradition they had access to. She said in the interview, that's also part of the spin that was really damaging. I thought, can you just tell them the truth? Can you say to the world you're not giving him a title and we want to keep him safe? And if that he's not a prince, that is not part of the tradition. Just tell people and they'll understand. But they wouldn't do that. So despite the press narrative being that it was Meghan that did not want to do the traditional circus on the steps, it wasn't actually her decision personally not to showcase Archie. But she wasn't allowed to correct the palace's statement and she got attacked for it. She got attacked for the fact that the press and public had to wait a millisecond longer to see her baby. How dare the press attack a woman for deciding when the world gets to see her baby? And how dare anybody call her controlling or a narcissist? A woman and her partner have every right to control what they do with their child. It doesn't matter if that baby is royal. And the British press and some members of the British public seem to think that this type of abuse is okay. Now, professional stalker Ingrid Stewart made a comment about the matter and she said, and I quote, For decades, royal women have obliged the public with a moment on the steps. Whether she likes it or not, many will feel Meghan is public property and given that her life living in luxury is largely funded by the taxpayer, it is a small price to pay. Many fans will feel shortchanged. So instead of criticising the individuals who view Meghan as private property and telling them to get a darn life, because I don't know who gets this emotional about not being able to see a baby, she's actually doubling down on the idea that Meghan is public property. I don't know which fans of these she's talking about that are going to feel shortchanged because the Sussex squad were not bothered at all that we didn't get to see Archie immediately after the birth. As far as we're concerned, Harry and Meghan can do what they want with their children. Truth be told, the only people that would feel short change, literally, as in their bottom line would be affected, is the press. Definitely not Harry and Meghan's fans. It was in fact people that dislike Meghan who were the most teed off, it seems. If you recall, when Princess Eugenie had her baby, she just posted about it on Instagram and no one batted an eyelid because no one would have made a lot of money from those photos. Hence, the rodents in the British press pack did not care. So that just shows you that it's all about money. It's not really about protocol, as they want to put it. In terms of normality, the way Eugenie presented her baby is probably the most normal and modern way a royal has been showcased. This is how most couples nowadays show their newborns on social media, not in front of the glare of snapping photographers in a media circus. My taxpayer money has paid for the golden cots of all of the Cambridge children, 
but I do not believe that I have ownership over them or their mother. That is a very sick and twisted way of thinking. And I honestly believe that if Kate has said I want more time with my baby privately before showing him or her to the world, I can bet it would have been seen as aggressive and you can also bet that they probably would have used Diana's words and her discomfort with the whole thing as a buffer to tame the press. When you take into consideration how Archie was treated immediately after he was born, there was every reason to protect him. He was bullied with racially toned attacks, not just on social media by members of the public, but also by so-called comedians that can't come up with any other material aside from calling a mixed race baby a monkey and crazed neo-Nazis calling Prince Harry a race traitor. So can you really blame Harry and Meghan for wanting to protect him? And I do think that having Archie was a turning point for both Harry and Meghan. I don't even want to think about how that baby would be treated and talked about in the royal household. I believe that he would have been in grave danger if he was still in the United Kingdom. One thing that has never really come to light was why the night nurse who was on duty when Archie was born was dismissed. We don't know what happened and I don't want to speculate, but you have to wonder what it is this woman did that would have her not only struck off, but would shake Harry and Meghan enough that they would look over Archie themselves when they have an endless conveyor belt of stuff available at their beck and call. And who could forget the absolute embarrassment that was the British press attacking Meghan for holding her baby bump? Holding your bump, I think, is a very innate and protective response. It's a sign of nurturing and protection. It's no surprise that her body language reflected that. It reflected a woman who was being attacked while pregnant. If the royal family want to show that they are coming into the modern age, one way they can do that at least is to make sure that when future heirs have children, their wives, or they themselves, in the case of Princess Charlotte, aren't treated like commodities and they need to create a culture where royal women are celebrated for more than just being producers of heirs. It makes me so happy that no one has seen Baby Lily as of making this video and that the royal rat pack are just so pathetically desperate to see that kid and they have to wait until Meghan and Harry decide and that could be a long time from now. So I hope you enjoyed that, it was a little bit different from the usual stuff but it's always great to look back in time because you see that it tends to be the same-ish, different century and Meghan has definitely brought about a new era. Don't forget to like, comment, share with your besties and subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Ciao!